keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough Every single lie that tells me I will never measure Am I more than just the sum of every high and every low? Remind me once again just who I am because I need to know. Ooh, oh, you said. You'll have every failure, God. You'll have every victory. Ooh, oh, you say. Good morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let, Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's a great day to be in the house of God. It's a great day to be with you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, just some announcements. Uh, next Friday and Sunday, we'll start our in-person services. Uh, first of all, I wanna say, I know that not everybody will be comfortable with that yet, and that's perfectly fine. Our services will be online just like they have been. Uh, so you can worship at home. Uh, but we still have drive-through communion. It will happen um, every Sunday uh, morning between 10 and 10.45. Now, that does not include today. That begins next week. Um, 
If you are able, uh, please let us know which service you would like to attend, just so we can get a gauge about how many people to expect. Uh, we'll be practicing physical distancing and uh, trying to only keep households together, but try to keep people just apart and things. The pews have been marked off. We'll see how that goes, and hopefully over the course of the month, we'll find that things are opening up more, people are safer, and we can, we can get back more to the normal style of a Sunday morning. Uh, we really encourage you to wear a face mask. Uh, the face mask is not to keep you protected. Did you know that? It is for you not to cough and hack your germs on somebody else. So um, just out of courtesy, I'd really recommend that. And then just like some of you did, you sat down and then when you go, when you leave, you might want to put it back on just for the courtesy of your brother and sister in Christ. Uh, we uh, uh, pastors and deacon will be wearing ours as long, whenever we're out with the crowd. While we're up here, we won't because of the taping. Uh, gloves are not necessary. In fact, um, I find gloves, I find people are re-wearing gloves. They go to the store, they put their gloves in their car, and then they put them back on and they're coming in. I, I don't want to touch those gloves. <laughs> Who knows? But you're better off doing what? For how long? 20 seconds. Vigorously with soap. Uh, by the way, we have discovered, Kristen and Joy have discovered that praying the Lord's Prayer is 20 seconds. So you can pray the Lord's Prayer or sing Row, Row, Your Boat twice or something like that. You know, there's a lot of different things to uh, do. Um, let's see. Um, we'll uh, explain more next week about when, when people are here about the ushering out and in and all those kind of things. Please always enter in the, in the glass doors in the front of the church uh, just to keep everything kind of moving in one direction. Uh, let's see. I talked about that. Um, if you're uncomfortable coming into the sanctuary uh, for communion, uh, we will still be doing drive-through communion every Sunday. So today between, excuse me, a week from today between 10 and 1045, you're welcome to drive through the parking lot and go back to the gym area. Pastor Stan and Deacon Joe will meet you there to uh, serve you communion. Uh, we'll also be doing in-person Bible study, uh, but it will still be Zoomed. So if you're part of my Sunday morning Bible study, uh, you can still do it from your computer, but we'll also have it available if you'd like to come in person and just we'll be physically distant from one another. If you have any kind of prayer needs, uh, please email the church office at church at RedeemerStuart.com. Praise reports, prayer needs, or whatever. Um, we're not going to be using the cards for a little while, so uh, please um, use that method so we can continue to pray for you. Uh, we have a number of Zoom. Zoom means just online Bible studies uh, that are going on. We have our men's group at Tuesday morning at 8. Uh, we have Revelation Wednesday afternoon at 2. We have Thursday night at 6.30 with Job. And Sunday morning will now be starting um, next week at, at 10 o'clock. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, and a women's study on... Um, on Paul's missionary journeys. That's at seven o'clock on uh, uh, Sunday night. And on Wednesday evening is Pastor Paul's um, Bible study on anxious for nothing. If you would like to be part of any of those, just let me know or let Krista know in the church office and we'll get you signed up for that. Uh, today is the day of Pentecost. Pentecost. You can see the red. Um, so today we celebrate the church. So it's a little bit of a mix because we're going to hear once again the last of the apparent Jesus' resurrection appearances uh, up in Galilee where he gave the Great Commission, which is a very churchy kind of thing. Uh, but we'll also be finishing up the book of Colossians and hearing the last part of it. So if you've been part of all these services, you've heard the whole book of Colossians and pretty much all the resurrection appearances of Jesus. And we hope that that has been a blessing to you. Uh, next week, we start a new series. It's called... I just forgot. Um, oh. oh, I did too. The summer of prayer. The summer of prayer. I'm glad. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, this is Kristen's idea. So summer of prayer. And it's a little different. It's looking at how Jesus prayed himself. So it's not teaching you the Lord's prayer. It's teaching you about how Jesus prayed. And what we can learn from him and his relationship with his heavenly father to teach us how we can have a summer and a lifetime of prayer, of talking to our Heavenly Father. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Uh, you do the praying. Just a silent word of prayer, you can pray out loud. First of all, pray for yourself and for the people around you. 
And also pray for this whole situation in the Twin Cities. It's a lot of weird things going on. A lot of evils happening in a lot of different ways. I'm not judging anything right now, but I'm just telling you, it's, it's not good up there. I have family members up there that say this town is burning. It's just, you know, and we just need our, our, our brothers and our sisters to be protected and also for the church to rise up to address the situation and to try to bring calm and peace uh, to, to people. So let's pray for, for those people up there. And all these people we lift up in the name of Jesus and all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Um, just uh, we begin with the uh, opening song. Uh, please stand. <clears throat> Remember our baptism in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. If Christ has not been raised, our faith is futile, and we are still in our sins. But, but the, the fact, fact is, is that Christ, Christ has been, been raised from, from the dead. dead. For in Adam all die. So, so also, also in Christ, Christ shall, shall all be made, made alive. alive. Since Christ Jesus is living, we approach him for grace and forgiveness. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me and paying the debt of my sin. I confess it to you, and by faith I claim your forgiveness. Free me from my sin and help me live the new resurrected life of my baptism. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, be assured Jesus has heard you. He has told me to share with you that your sin is forgiven through his death and resurrection. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and rejoice. Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah.
forsaken, take me, Jesus, take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus. We pray together. Holy, Holy Spirit, Spirit, come, come and, and build, build the church, church making, making us committed, committed loving disciples, disciples for Jesus and one another. In, in his, his name, name. Amen. amen. You may be seated. Today's New Testament reading comes from the book of Colossians, reading from the fourth chapter. Tychius will tell you all about my activities. He is a beloved brother and faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know that we are who we are, and that he may encourage your hearts. And with him, Onesus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you. They will tell you of everything that has taken place here. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you, and Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, concerning whom you have received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are the only men of the circumcision among my fellow workers for the kingdom of God, and they have been a comfort to me. Epirus, who is one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, greets you, always struggling on your behalf in his prayers, that you may stand mature and fully assured in all the will of God. For I bear, bear him witness that he has worked hard for you and for those in Laodicea and Heropolis. Luke, the beloved physician, greets you, as does Demas. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. And when this letter has been read among you, have it also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and see that you also read the letter from Laodicea. And say to Arbacus, see that you fulfill the ministry that you have received in the Lord. I, Paul, write this greeting with my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Christ is risen. Is risen, is risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Please stand. The resurrection appearance reading comes from the book of Matthew, reading from the 28th chapter. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Christ is risen. Is risen, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated. We invite the kids to come in front of the TV or come down front. Just kind of spread out, though. Uh, today is uh, Pentecost, Pentecost, the time when God gives his church the Holy Spirit. 
So I thought, what better way to tell you about why we need the Holy Spirit? Now, you notice I have two things here. One of these you might recognize as a balloon. A balloon. And the other one you might recognize as a <laughs> noisemaker. Now, in order to have fun with these things, what does it need? Air. Needs air. Hot air. A lot of hot air sometimes, too. All right? <laughs> Needs air. Otherwise, you just can't seem to have very much fun with it. So I'll show you here on the balloon. Now you can see that um, with my balloon here now, I can do a lot of different things with it, right? One thing is that. Yeah, that makes it fun. I love doing stuff. See, but I can't do that without air. I can't have fun without air. Or this thing here, this party blower here. If I just hold it up, it's not very fun. But when it gets air, I can do a lot of fun things with it. And I can annoy a lot of people. All right. But it reminds us the gift of the Holy Spirit, that without the Holy Spirit, I can't believe in Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit, I can't live for Jesus. Without the Holy Spirit, I can't love God. I can't love my neighbor. Without the Holy Spirit, I can't have eternal life because the Holy Spirit is the one who gives me faith in Jesus to know he's my Lord and my Savior. And Jesus told us, he said, continually ask for the gift of the Holy Spirit so that we can be filled with the breath of God. And we can do many good things with the Holy Spirit. And just like these toys, when you put air to them, they can do a lot of fun things. So with the Holy Spirit, we can do the fun things that God has called us to do and to be. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, send me, send me the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, so that I, so that I will continually, will continually believe in you, believe in you, live for you, live for you, and look forward to your coming, and look forward to your coming. Amen. Amen. All right, we stand to sing.
We thank you so much, Heavenly Father, for the day you've given us and this opportunity to gather together and worship. We just pray for your Holy Spirit to be upon us, to guide and lead us as we understand what is the ministry and the mission that you have given us, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Bless us in our hearing of the word and our doing of the word. In Jesus' name we pray and God's people say, Amen. 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 You may be seated. In some ways, about the only sport that's probably doing much of anything right now, and we'll see what happens this fall, is football. Now, when you think football, and you're thinking professional football, and you're thinking one of the greatest coaches that came in professional football, by the way, they named the Super Bowl trophy after him. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? Lombardi. Vince Lombardi. And I remember watching Vince Lombardi talk, you know, from the stand, you know, as a TV viewer watching him on the sidelines in the first two Super Bowls and all those kind of things. But it was, uh, the story goes that Vince Lombardi, when he would meet with the team for summer training, I guess, training camp, he would always enter the first, the first practice and he would have all the team in front of him and he would hold out a football and he'd say, gentlemen, this is a football. Now you're thinking, well, why would this guy hold out a football and say, this is a football? Don't they all know that? Well, because if you know anything about the style of his coaching was that you had to be perfected in the fundamentals of the game, in the basics of the game. If you couldn't play with the fundamentals of the game, you weren't going to play for Coach Lombardi because that's what made him a winner, because you played fundamentally sound. He didn't have many plays in the playbook, if you remember. Yeah. But they played them and they played them well because they were fundamentally sound. They got back to the basics. And I thought that's a good way of looking at the church. You know, sometimes in the church we get all enthused about programs and doing this and doing that. That sometimes we get away from the fundamentals and the basics of really what makes us the church. And makes our ministry and our mission a success in God's eyes. And that's what I want to talk about today. Because I think in our two readings we get some understanding of what those fundamentals are. The first fundamental is together. You know, one of the big things they're learning from this pandemic is how hard it has been for people not to be together. Now, there's some people that are real loners that probably don't really care, you know, if they're alone and nobody ever calls them or anything. But I got a feeling even people that are extreme introverts need somebody somebody else, and the isolation has been nasty on people. Because God didn't call us to be sequestered from one another, he's called us to be together. And not only that, Jesus, that's how he's called his church. Yes, Jesus called us each individually in faith to come to believe in him, we were all baptized individually, the Holy Spirit came upon each one of us individually, but he united us as the church. And when you look at the reading in Matthew, who came to see Jesus in that post-resurrection appearance? The 11 disciples. They came together because Jesus called them to be together. That was his whole ministry was together with them. And so how important it is that the church is always together. That's how God designed it. That's how God wants it. And that's how God blesses us with one another. Now, being together has a couple pitfalls. The first one is, did you notice two things in the readings? Number one, from the gospel reading, how many disciples came to see Jesus in Galilee? Two. What's wrong with that number? You're missing one. That is right, Ralph, you're missing one. And who are you missing? Judas. Judas. In Paul's reading, he mentions a, a fellow worker by the name of Demas. Otherwise, you wouldn't have known it, right? He lists him there as a fellow worker, someone who encouraged him and stayed with him. You get the second Timothy when Paul is just about ready to be uh, killed, beheaded by Nero. It's Paul that says of Demas, Demas fell in love with the world and has left me to go back to Thessalonica. Hmm. And most scholars believe what Paul is saying is he fell from the faith. He and Judas both had a love for the world. He and Judas both had a love for money, more than their savior, more than their fellow believer. And that's what you're gonna find. If you're gonna to be together in the body of Christ, be ready to be disappointed. Be ready to sometimes be heartbroken. 
that people sometimes you think are so close to the Lord and everything and are following the Lord and living for the Lord suddenly turn away from you, turn away from the fellowship. It happens. It happens all the time. And for pastors, it's, it's, heart, it's gut-wrenching. It's heart-wrenching to see that happen when people leave. And it's hard for even the people that are part of the fellowship. Nobody understands it. What do you mean they gave up the faith? The other thing you will find in the fellowship, you're going to find a number of people that, (laughs) number, all of us, that are people of faith and a people of doubts. Did you notice that when uh, Jesus, when the disciples came? It says they all saw Jesus and they were glad to see him and they worshiped him, but some doubted. It's interesting that word some is not included in the Greek. It basically says, really, it says, they worshiped him and doubted. Now the question is, is what were they doubting? Didn't they see him alive? Didn't they see him resurrected? Is that what he was talking about? Some people believe that's exactly what was happening. It was, it was this faith doubt thing going on. You know, and have you ever felt that? One minute you're in this great faith and the next minute you're in this doubt of faith and you go, you get the same thing. Remember when Peter and the disciples were in the boat, Jesus was walking on water and then Peter yells out, hey, let me come out to you. Oh, come on out, Peter. Peter gets out of the boat, takes one step. And he takes his eyes off Jesus and he starts looking around and he gets scared. And what happens to him? He starts sinking. Jesus, of course, rescues him and and brings him up, takes him in the boat. And it says, Peter, why did you doubt? And then it says the disciples worshiped him. Faith and doubt hang together. And that's what you'll see in a fellowship. We all have our doubts. We all have our faith. And everybody's at a different place. But that's why God brings us together, to encourage one another, to help one another. The other way that sometimes that's how that doubt is looked at, and I had never heard this before until I did this study, is that the disciples knew what Jesus was going to ask them to do. Because all his ministry, he said, yes, I'm first going to the Jewish people, because I'm a Jewish Messiah. I'm first going to Israel, but I'm also going to come for the Gentile. And some contend that the disciples knew exactly what he was going to say. Because if you notice in what we call the Great Commission, Jesus told them, he says, I want you to go to all the Gentiles, baptizing and teaching. That's to all the nations. He's not talking about Israel. You know you need to go to Israel, to the Israelites. But now you're going to go to the Gentiles. And the disciples, 11 of them are looking at, what? We have to go to all the world? We have to learn all these languages. We have to do all these cultures and these foods and all that. That's intimidating, isn't it? And just to think, if it's 11 disciples plus maybe, what, another 100 believers, and Jesus is saying, you're going to transform the world. And they're going, what? I doubt it. They didn't understand the role of the Holy Spirit that would come upon them and bless them. So when we're in in doing the mission that God has given us, it will be intimidating. It'll be hard to fathom how we, even as a little redeemer, can do anything for anybody. But that's if we're thinking of ourselves. But if we're looking to Jesus and we're looking to the power of the Holy Spirit to lead and to direct us, we can do many good things for the Lord. And the church does many good things all around the world in the name of Jesus, because the Holy Spirit is with us. The second thing I noticed in this reading, these readings, is Jesus gave him authority. Authority. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now, what allowed a player on the Green Bay Packers under Vince Lombardi to be able to play the game? It was the church giving them the direction and the authority to do what their position was. He's the coach. Jesus is like the coach. He's the one that gives the authority. You remember when Jesus was asked by the centurion to heal his servant? And Jesus is on his way to the house and eventually the centurion comes and meets him and says, I don't deserve you to have in my house. In fact, all you have to do is say the word and my servant will be well. Because I'm a man under authority and I have authority over other men. I tell this one to do this and he does it because I give him the authority. I authorize him to do it in my name. Jesus, all you have to do is say the word and I know you command authority. You can do what you say. 
So Jesus, you know, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. He authorizes his disciples. He authorizes us to be able to do it in his name. It reminds me a little bit of um, uh, in our school, uh, one of our main buildings into the school, where the school office is and that, we have electronic keys. And you go there and you, put, you, know, you take that electronic key, sort of like you do at the hotels, you know, you swipe, you, know, you do that key or something, and the door opens up and it unlocks so you can go in. Well, how do I get that ability to go into that door? It's because someone has authorized this key. I didn't do it. The church has done it by calling me as the pastor. The school has done it by saying, Pastor, we need you to be in this ministry, so we're authorizing you to come into this building to be able to do your ministry. They give me the authority. You as the congregation give me the authority to be able to do that. And so in confidence, I can use that key. I can go in and do what God calls me to do. So Jesus has given us the authority to do what he has called us to do. The third thing I get out of this, the job, the job. Do you know what the job is? When we usually translate Matthew 28, it's what? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations and baptizing them to the Father and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. What's the command? What's the imperative? Go. What was it? Go. Those are all participles in Greek. You see how they translate it? They don't really translate it correctly. The only command is make disciples. Make disciples. We'll get to the go in a minute. But making disciples. Now, that means make followers. Now, you're looking at that going, why would Jesus in his right mind pick me to try to go make followers. I'm the most inept person to make, be able to do that. I, I know what you're thinking of yourself out there. You're thinking like I am. There's no way I can do this. I, I don't have the gifts and the talents to do this. I'm not pastor material mission. Yeah, you are, because you've been given the authority for what? But here it is. Why would Jesus pick you and me? Imperfect that we are, doubting, faithful people. Why would he pick us? Let me give it to you this way. Jesus was an excellent marketeer. Because, for example, a doctor. Would you trust a doctor to get on the TV and say, I am the greatest doctor that ever walked the earth. I can cure all your ills and everything. And you're going, what? But, if Catherine over here comes to me and says, Pastor, I hear that you have a, a botched up hernia. You know, I know a friend of mine that went to this doctor and he or she did excellent work. You should go check it out. Would I trust that doctor to go to that doctor more than the one that sat on TV just pontificating about what he or she could do? Of course I am because I have recommendation. I have someone who's experienced it. I know someone who is, they're good at it. And that's where I want to go. Right? So who does Jesus pick to go share his good news? Us! People that have experienced the grace. People that have understood forgiveness. The people that have been given faith. The people that have the assurance of eternal life. The people that have been gifted by the Holy Spirit. The people that have been guided by him and cared for by him and disciplined by him. We who have experienced that relationship. We are the best marketing agent that he could ever find. Do you remember when Jesus healed the, the, uh, the, the demoniac guy in, on the, in the Gezerines? Mm -hmm. Remember the guy was nuts. He was running around naked and everything. He was breaking chains. He was going all things. And then Jesus finally sends the demons into the pigs. Remember the pigs go off into the abyss and all that. Guy comes back in his right mind. People don't understand how to take this. And finally... Uh, there he's sitting there calm and everything he said jesus he said jesus i want to follow you wherever you would go and you remember what jesus said to him no you go back to your hometown and your family and you tell them everything that god has done for them mm -hmm. jesus knows how to market that's why he chooses you and me to do the job the fourth thing equipped what good would it be 
If Vince Lombardi could coach football, but he didn't equip his players with good footballs, shoulder pads, helmets, those kind of things. You gotta equip somebody. And you know the thing is, that costs money. But what Jesus gives us costs nothing, because it's his gift. And those where the three participles come in. You know what a participle is, it's an ing word. It, it modifies the command word. So if you're gonna go make disciples, what are the ing words? Going. You know what's better translated there is not go, the better translation would be, as you're going along doing your stuff, make disciples. That's really what it means. Why translations do that, I have no idea. In other words, it's not telling you that you have to become a pastor, a missionary, evangelist, you have to be trained in a seminary and get all this great education. No. Jesus says, I have filled you with the Holy Spirit. I've given you authority. Now, as you're going along in life, make disciples. Make followers. And how is the, one is the best way to make a follower? Is to let them see your face shine in you. That's why parents are the best agents in teaching of making disciples of their children. Because children are going to look to them naturally. It's just part of the way God designed it to be. And then if a parent is living out their faith and the joy of that faith and the repentance of that faith and the forgiveness of that faith and all those kind of things, guess what a kid's going to learn? More than likely is going to learn the same thing. Because their parents, by their example, are making them into disciples. As you go along the way, as you go to work, as you go to school, as you, as you go to the store, as you go to here, as you go to the neighbor, as when golf courses get open and all this kind of stuff, wherever you go along your way, always see it as the opportunity to make a disciple. You know, St. Paul said this, and it sounds kind of bragging at first until you understand what he's trying to say. He says, in everything, follow my example. He wasn't bragging. What he was saying was, is I try to model my life in repentance and faith and sanctification. Follow me in that. I'm going to model it for you. Follow me in that. Learn it. Become a disciple in it. To go along the way. The second one is, is baptizing. Now, generally speaking, most of us are going to go, well, pastor, I don't baptize. You've been authorized to baptize. Did you know that? Now, generally speaking, you're not going to probably baptize too many yourself because you understand it's a celebration of the fellowship. It's a celebration of someone coming into the family of God. So normally you're going to go to the one who has been called by that congregation to baptize and to bring people into the kingdom that way. And, and I get that all the time. I've had grandparents bring grandkids. I've had friends bring friends. I've had, I've had older people. I have younger people. I get a lot of babies. I get this. I get, it's it, because people understand it's a celebration of the family of God. So you pick the one called by the family of God to represent Christ in this place, right? So you go to the pastor, the deacon or whatever to, to get that done. But you can baptize, in fact, I know a member of our congregation who baptized his father on his deathbed because he was an unbeliever till his deathbed and he baptized him. You are authorized to baptize, usually in emergency situations. Otherwise, you come together, but you've been given that gift to baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The other last one is, of course, is teaching. Teaching to obey. I don't like the word obey just because somehow as an American you hear obey, you kind of get bent out of shape by the word. It's really um, to teach someone how to live. Teaching someone how to live. That's really what it is. Teaching them for action. Can you imagine Vince Lombardi getting his football team together and say, okay, here's a football. Here are the plays. Okay, everybody go home. Well, that'd be ludicrous. No, you go, it's for the game. It's to play the game. So it is as we, either as individuals or collectively as the church, we teach for action. We teach to get people to implement their faith in their daily life. That's teaching to obey, right? Teaching to put into action their faith and their words. 
Sometimes what has happened in the church, and fortunately I think we're coming out of that, sometimes the church has got, especially Lutherans, we got in this thing of teaching information. And we thought that if we taught information enough, if we taught enough theology, we could change people's lives. But that's not how it works. Kids just not only need information and theology, they also need to, what does it mean to live it? What does it look like? What does it look like in action? Because if I can get you to act on it, you will learn it, right? If I can get it to act, and teachers know this, right? Teachers, you know that. If I can get the kids to act on it, just not put some things on the board, right, Catherine, and then suddenly they should know it. No, I'm gonna give them examples of how to do this, okay? You know, you go to the store, you buy two apples, and you buy two more apples. How many apples do you have? Hopefully you're saying four, okay? And hopefully you're seeing two and two, okay? You know what I mean, okay? But you gave a practical example. You said, hey, you're going to the store, you need four apples, and over here, two apples, over here, two apples, is, what does that make? Okay, four, okay? You give them a real life experience, and then make them go out and put it to action. That's teaching, teaching. The last one, presence. What did Jesus say? What was the last thing in Matthew's gospel Jesus said? I will be with you always to the very end of the age or the end of the world. There's various translations all mean basically the same thing. I'm gonna be with you to the end. Now, the one thing about Vince Lombardi is what was one thing he could never do with his team? He couldn't play the, in the game. He stood on the sideline right? Oh, he yelled, he sent in plays, he did this, he came, you know, getting on players' cates when they come, but he couldn't get in the game. Jesus said, I'm going to be in the trenches with you. I just don't call you and authorize you to do this, but I'm going to come and be with you, actually with you, with my very presence, and in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and I'm going to be there with you in my word. I'm going to be there with you in my table. I'm going to be there with you in prayer. I'm going to be there with you. Because I know with my presence will strengthen you and help you to be everything you can be. Back to the basics. The fundamentals of what it means to be a person in the family of God. And I pray you learned a little bit, not know much about Vince Lombardi. It's always good to remember the heroes of the game, you know, but really, it's, you're part of the church. You're part of the church to what? To be together with the authority to do the job because you've been equipped and the presence of Christ is with you. Be who he has called you to be. Do what he's called you to do and be blessed. We stand for creed and for prayer. I believe in God, the Father Father Almighty, Almighty, maker maker of of heaven heaven and and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit, born of the Virgin Virgin Mary, Mary, suffered suffered under under Pontius Pontius Pilate, Pilate, was crucified, crucified, died, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Holy Trinity, Through baptism, we have been connected to you, given your name. Father, daily give us the confidence to know you will provide and protect us. Lord Jesus, assure us that in you we are forgiven and fit for heaven. Holy Spirit, continually nurture our faith and help us joyfully follow the Savior. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, help your church to stay true to the fundamentals of ministry and mission. Bind us together in faith. Empower us to go confidently in Christ's authority. Focus our efforts in disciple-making. As you make this true for us, make it true for these brothers and sisters at Redeemer Lutheran Church in Inglewood, Florida, Lutheran Services, Florida, Tampa, Florida, Racine uh, Lutheran High School, Racine, Wisconsin, St. Paul Lutheran School, Hilton, New York. Lord, in your mercy, 
Hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, please give wisdom to our government leaders as they determine the best course to take as businesses reopen and getting people back to work to make a living. Thank you that this is beginning. Please help us be prudent, safe, patient, and committed to the welfare of our neighbor. Help us be cautious, but never live in fear. Continue to protect workers in the healthcare field. Please help families as they face financial uh, issues because of unemployment or business owners trying to navigate surviving and reopening. Uh, Please uh, give peace and justice to the whole situation in in the Twin Cities. We bring to you these local businesses, uh, uh, Conlin and Associates, Linden Nursing Service, and Royal Palms Motel. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, you are the giver of all good gifts. Provide the gift of healing to all affected by this virus and other maladies. We bring before your throne of grace, Kathy Zimmerman, Edith Wood, the Reynolds family, Stan Byes, Gary Gendron, Jack Onan, Keith Ho, uh, Val Greenwasser, Nikki Losey, Gary Chag, Pam McCormick, Karen Zelvin, Jen and Walena Hughes, Lydia Glarden, Frank Swift, Virginia Mossberg, Beverly Sroka, Jennifer Bouchers, and uh, please give comfort to Annalise Sorsch on the death of her husband, Werner. And now we, and the rest that we name in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Holy Spirit, this virus and subsequent quarantining has disrupted many homes. Some from stresses of online schooling, which I think is, start, is now ending for many, uh, working from home, loss of income, or just plain isolation. Visit homes and bring your peace. Strengthen the homes of your people, and may we shine the light of your love, joy, and peace. Bless these anniversary couples, Josh and Inga Smith, uh, Gary and Barbara Gendron, Michael and Sylvia Gray. And bless these homes, Dan and Nancy Warren, Polly Wixon, Terry and Jane Wolf, Gary and Alexa Williams, Jeff Whiteman, Nancy Andachek, with Chris and Jen Baker, Carl and Val Bloom, Gladys Carroll, Steve and Cheryl Goodman. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. prayer. Into your hands, O oh Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. 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 You may be seated. This time we normally uh, take our offering uh, during this uh, time of transitions. Uh, We'll be taking the offerings as people come in the door or as you leave the exits. There'll be offering boxes out that I have to do is drop it. Just drop it in. You don't have to touch anything. Um, But we do thank you for your generosity and uh, God's blessings as we move forward during this time. Um, So uh, we, uh, I think we have uh, we have Natalie singing for us, right? Wonderful. Just 
Heavenly Father, we just thank you for the gifts that you've given to us. And Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters who give us back a portion of those gifts and uh, that we can use these gifts to go out into our community and strive to be the best that we can to help others understand what your command to us is, that we ought to go out and baptize people in, from all nations from one end of the world to the other. And we thank you for the gift, and we thank you for the many blessings you give unto us in your Son's holy name. Amen. 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 Let us pray together now with the words our Lord has given us for prayer. Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, 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 hallowed be thy name. name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come. come. Thy, thy will be done on earth, earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our, our trespasses. trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day of Pentecost, that we can celebrate with our brothers and sisters, those who are here in our midst this morning, and those also that are at home taking part of this service from their homes. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that empowers us to willingly go out into our communities and the communities of all the world to share your gospel message and the message of your Son, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us in our lives. We thank you for all these blessings and the blessings you give us and because we ask for them, but then the blessings that you give us and we didn't ask for them, but you gave them to us anyway because you know we needed them. And we thank you for the, all these blessings in your son's holy name. Amen. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen. 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 Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.